Colony PCR is a quick way you can see if a colony, so one of these little clumps of bacteria, actually has the plasmid that you cloned and that you cloned it correctly. With molecular cloning, we can stick a piece of DNA, such as the instructions for making a protein, into a circular piece of DNA called a plasmid. Um, and then this plasmid, we can stick it into bacteria and get the bacteria to do things like make lots of the protein. But if there's that if, if that cloning process didn't work correctly, well then the bacteria are not going to know what to make and they're going to make weird stuff. So we need to make sure that our cloning actually worked. You could purify that, the, back, the plasmid and do some tests on it. But if you want just like a quick idea whether it probably worked, you can do colony PCR, which lets you get in a sense of this without actually having to purify anything. So all you have to do is take like a pipette um, tip did a little clump, touch the clump, um, and then what you do is you mix it around in your PCR mix. Now PCR stands for polymerase chain reaction, and it's a technique that we can use to make lots of copies of DNA. The specific thing is that we can specify which regions of DNA we want copied, and the way that we do this is using primers, which are these short little pieces of DNA. These are going to instruct DNA polymerase, so the copying machinery, where to make co copies. It's kind of like if you think about the DNA strands as train tracks and the polymerase as a train that makes copies laying down the track as it goes along, we need to provide what's, tell it what stations to start and stop at, and that's where the primers come in. Now those primers have to match the sequence. So if you make a primer who matches your insert, so the piece that you think you cloned into there, and then only if your insert is in there will you get a product. You could also do things like make primers that only match the parts around your insert, so the vector backbone, um, and then whether or not your insert is in there, you'll get different size products. And so then we can, we can separate these products using agarose gel electrophoresis, separates those products by size, and then we can take a look and see how many of products there are and what size they are. Um, so this is a similar concept to like the molecular test used to test for viruses um, like the SARS-CoV-2. And But in those cases, you're monitoring the products as they're made, whereas in this case, you're actually viewing the products after. Um, so like you make let them make the products and then you run the gel to take a look. So colony PCR is really great because you don't have to do any purification as opposed to things like an analytical restriction digest, which I talked about yesterday. The reason why you don't have to do any of this purification is basically the first step in PCR is you get things really, really hot to move those DNA strands apart so that the primers can bind. And when that happens, it's going to break the cells open. And since you only need a really, really tiny little amount, because what's going to happen is you're going to make copies of the DNA. And so you only need a tiny little amount to start with, because then each time you get double, 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 and you start getting a lot, a lot of DNA. So you only need a really, really bit, little, little bit, um, and you can break these cells open just with that heat and the stuff that's in the, um, the mix and stuff is going to help you. Um, and yeah, so basically colony PCR, then you can test if, if it probably worked, then you can go ahead and purify out the whole plasmid using like a mini prep. So it's helpful if when you take the colony in the beginning, if you take a little sample and you also grow like a five mil overnight culture, so then you can do a mini prep on it to purify out that plasmid, send it for sequencing to make sure there's not any typos because colony PCR can't tell you about that. So now let's step back and go into a little more of the details in a slower fashion. I just wanted to give you an overview first. Let's go. With molecular cloning, we can take the genetic instructions for making, say, a protein and stick that into a circular piece of DNA called the plasmid. This plasmid is going to serve as a vector or vehicle for getting that genetic information into cells. So we can stick that plasmid into bacterial cells and the bacteria will work with the instructions we give them to, say, make that corresponding protein. However, this cloning process isn't quite perfect. There can be problems with it. And so sometimes the cloning might not go exactly as you planned and your insert, the thing you're actually trying to put in, so say like your genetic information, doesn't actually get into that plasmid. And sometimes uh, it gets inserted, but with some mistakes. And so we need to make sure that the right thing is in there before we allow the bacteria to go ahead and make the protein and do and rely on using these bacteria to make that protein and this sort of thing. We need to be able to check that our cloning process actually worked. Now, the only way to know for sure if there are no typos, if all the stitching together weren't great, is with sequencing. However, 
we can do quick checks along the way to see if our insert probably got in there. And so a couple of these checks we can use are colony PCR and analytical digest. Today, I want to talk more about colony PCR. So yesterday, I did a post on analytical digest. So if you want to learn more about that, um, go see that post. But today, I want to talk about this colony PCR method, which is nice because it requires less work in terms of you don't have to actually purify out the plasmid before you do the checking. You can do it straight from that group of little colony. So just a terminology note is I'm going to be referring to this piece of DNA that you put in, like the gene, as the insert, because it doesn't have to be a gene. And often what it is, is it's complementary DNA or cDNA which is a DNA version of that messenger RNA copy of a gene. So you go from the gene, the DNA, to a messenger RNA, to a protein. And the messenger RNA is actually a slightly edited version of the DNA. So it's not a straight one-to-one -one copy, although it starts that way. It then gets edited out to remove regulatory information to give you messenger RNA. And so you want to put this edited version in, and so you make a DNA version of that called the cDNA, and that's what you put in. And so this is what I'll be calling the insert. And it doesn't have to be cDNA. There can also be other things that you would want to put into a plasmid. In any of these cases, though, you're going to be inserting something, and so we can refer to this term as the insert. And then the plasmid, this, this regular piece of DNA, and the backbone is going to be basically everything except for that insert. So we want to make sure that we have a plasmid in there that has both the ins that has the insert in there. We also want to make sure that the bacteria actually have the plasmid. So in this process called transformation, we can actually stick the, back, the plasmid into bacteria. However, not all the bacteria are actually going to take in the plasmid. And so we want to make sure that all the bacteria have the plasmid. So then we can focus on making sure that all of them with the plasmid have the insert. In order to make sure that they have the plasmid, we use a selection marker. This is typically an antibacterial resistance gene. We can then grow the bacteria in the presence of that corresponding antibiotic. If the cells have the antibiotic resistance gene, they're able to survive, but if they don't, then they will get killed. And therefore, we're only going to be allowing to grow the cells that actually have that plasmid of interest. These cells are gonna grow on top of each other in these groupy little colonies. And then these colonies, each of these is gonna be like a genetically identical. Some of these, hopefully most of them, will have the correct clone product, but some of them may not. Some of them might just have the plasmid that hasn't been modified, or they'll have the plasmid, um, but with some sort of um, wrong product inside. And so we want to make sure that we're going to select and use the colonies that have the plasmid in there and the right um, or the have the plasmid in there, yes, but all of these should have the plasmid in there. What we really care about now is that they have the insert in there. And so that's what we're going to check for in the, with the colony PCR. With the colony PCR, you're basically asking, okay, is there a sequence, is there the sequence in there? Or is there at least a sequence of the right size in there? Um, and then it's not checking for typos or anything, but we can use this as a screening in order to then determine which to take further. So which we want to actually purify out and do sequencing on. So as I mentioned, with the colony PCR, you don't have to actually purify the plasmid out first. With restriction digest, you actually do have to purify the plasmid out first. So one of the nice things about colony PCR is you can go straight from the colony. So typically what I do is I pick a pipette tip and I just kind of like briefly touch the catch the colony, get a little on, and then mix it into my PCR mix, and then take the rest of it, um, take that whole pipette, and dunk it into five mils of LB culture. Um, so this bacterial growth medium um, on like a shaker incubator overnight. Now this way, if the colony PCR shows that that was right, then the next day what I can do is I can go ahead and do a mini prep so with the mini prep, I'd be purifying out that plasmid, and then I can send it for sequencing. If the colony PCR showed it didn't work well, well then I can just toss that colony after, or that growth after I bleach it. Um, so you're able to kind of work in parallel, and therefore 
you don't have to waste time doing these mini preps if you don't need to, but you also save time because you've gotten the growth part started. So how does this PCR process work? So PCR stands for polymerase chain reaction. We use it for all sorts of different things in the lab. It's super duper helpful. It works based on the principles that one strand of DNA can act as a template for making another strand of DNA. This is because you have this one-to-one -one base complementarity where you have H, T, and C to G on base pairing across from each other. And this is the basis for how our cells can replicate our DNA is that they can use one strand as a copy, as a template for making the other. And when we do this in a we can do this in a test tube with this method called polymer chain reaction or PCR. It kind of mimics what's going on in the body, except it does so using heat in, in cycles of these heating and cooling. In our cells, we have enzymes, so we have reaction helpers, speeder uppers, um, things like tulpa isomerases and gyrases that actually, in particular cases and stuff that actually go and they separate the strands physically, like pull them apart. In the PCR, what we do is we use heat because we need to pull those strands apart in order to get use the strands separately as templates. In our cells, when we want to make copies of our DNA or like during replication, we're making copies of like the entire thing. But with PCR, we're, we're bookending a very specific region we want to make copies of. We're specifying the region we want to be copied using these short pieces of DNA called primers. And these primers are going to be complementary to, so they're basically going to have the opposite base pairing. They're going to mimic one of the strands, bind to the other strands, and allow DNA polymerase, so this enzyme, this DNA copier, to actually start making copies there. And so using these primers, we're able to direct where we want that to start. The P, the, they will then start going, <clears throat> start copying until the first cycle will just run out, run off. And then the next cycle, when you melt those strands again, so when you heat them up to separate the newly made strands, now they're going to act, those newly made strands are going to act as templates. And what you end up getting is you get this defined stretch of DNA um, this copy that's copied. And what's really nice is that it's starting where one primer starts and stopping where one primer stops. If you have one of those primers recognizing a sequence that's not actually there, well, now you're not even going to get a product. And if you have um, primers recognizing sequences where there's different lengths in between them, you're going to get different size products. And so this is the basis of being able to use colony PCR in order to see if an insert is or isn't there. And so we'll get more in a second into the different ways we can design these primers to get different information. Um, but first, just a quick note that if this sounds kind of familiar to you, we can use a similar concept, say, in diagnostic tests. So the classical test for SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, is that you're actually doing this PCR using primers that are directed against the virus. And so if the primer, if the viral RNA is there, um, well, in this case, it's RNA, but then it gets reverse transcribed, so then it's DNA. So because we use DNA, we're doing PCR, but the virus is an RNA virus. And so once we have the DNA, well, then we can use primers and say, okay, well, we have a primer against the region of the viral RNA or viral DNA. Um, and it's not going to, this primer recognizes a sequence that's not present in human DNA. So we should only get a product if we're doing, if the viral RNA is there. Um, in this case, we're using qPCR, which is a method where we're actually measuring the copies as they get made. But traditionally with colony PCR, what we're doing is we're actually running agarose gel electrophoresis to separate the products that get made after, so instead of watching it as they get made at the end, we then take the products that were made, run them through agarose gel electrophoresis. This is basically the sugary mesh that's going to slow down the molecules of DNA as they're moving through. The bigger molecules are gonna get slowed down more. And so when you turn off the electricity, get stop the drive that's, that's propelling them through the gel, the bigger products are going to be higher up, the smaller products lower down, and then compare them to a size ladder. 
So we're going to get a different, either a different number or different size of pieces, depending on whether or not the insert is there and depending on how we set up our primer reaction. The three main strategies we can use are vector-specific primers, insert-specific primers, and orientation-specific primers. So with a vector-specific primers, here your primers are only going to be recognizing the vector. And so instead of being like the case with our diagnostic test where we we're detecting sequences that were only present in the virus, that would be something akin to an insert-specific primer. But here we're actually doing something that's specific to the plasma. So you might say, okay, well, that doesn't seem very useful, except it is useful because although you'll get products either way, the products are going to be different sizes. And so if your insert is not there, well now if you have primers that are designed to be like flanking the insert and going into the insert, if the insert isn't there, you're gonna get a really tiny little product. The size of it, the actual size of it is going to depend on how far apart your primers were that you designed, um, how much there is in between them if the insert isn't there. If the insert is there, then you're going to get a product. So this, a nice thing about vector-specific primers is that you can use these same primers no matter what the insert is. So you can have, you can often what's done in laboratories is you kind of have standard plasmids that you use as vectors, and then you can just swap out whatever insert was in there. So the nice thing about vector-specific primers is that you can use those same primers with whatever insert is in here. So if you're using that same um, parent vector platform for different things, you can use the same primers. You don't have to order new ones each time. Unfortunately, this also means that if the in, it's going to work no matter what the insert is in there. And so if you have inserts that are similar size and you're using one plasmid as kind of the basis for making another plasmid, you're not going to be able to tell if you have the parent plasmid with the different insert or with the insert of interest. You don't have any spe insert specific information in this way. You also, if they're different sizes, you might be able to tell based on the size of the pieces, but you still won't know. Um, so that's another reason why it's important to also use like a negative control where you have your plasma, your unmodified plasmids and your parent plasmids. Okay. So then there's another piece of information that this doesn't give you is the orientation. So with some cloning methods, you don't have to worry about this. With other cloning methods, such as if you're using some sort of blunt end clothing, what can happen is that your insert can actually go in there either way. So when you're using methods that use something like restriction cloning with sticky overhangs, so where the ends of the insert are different when you're stitching them together, then you don't have to worry as much about this because they're only going to match in a specific, if the insert is in there in the right orientation. But if your ends are blunt, what can happen is it can actually go in backwards. And then what happens is whatever was in the insert, well now everything in this part is backwards and everything in these parts are forwards and it's not gonna work. Um, if you have insert specific, vector specific primers, you're not going to be able to know whether or not that insert was in there the right way. If you want to know whether the insert was in there the right way, well, now you can use something like an orientation specific primer. An orientation specific primer, here what you do is you have one primer that's inside the insert and one primer that's outside the insert. This way you're only going to get a product if you, so the one that's inside the insert is going in, going in through the insert out into the space where there's the primer outside that's going into the insert. So one primer is on the outside going in, one is on the inside going out. Um, and you'll have, if the product, if the insert is in there in the right direction, it'll go in and you'll get a product. It'll go towards that, that vector specific primer. But if the insert is in there backwards, you'll get that primer binding, but now it's gonna be trying to it's not going to have like a bookend. So you, when you have your primer, you need to have one going one direction and one going the other direction. In this case, you have them both going the same direction. And so that's not gonna work. It's not gonna generate a product for you and you're not going to get a product. So you're only going to get a product if your insert is in there and it's in the right direction. 
The third type of primers that we can design are insert specific primers. So here, both of the primers are going to bind inside of your insert. And they basically, it's not going to be able to tell you about the orientation because one on one, one on the other, even if it's top upside down, it's still going to be, the primers are going to be going towards one another and you'll get a product and you'll get the same product. But if the insert isn't there, then you're not going to get any product at all. So this is then how you can, after you run that gel to separate the products by size, do some sort of fluorescent nucleic acid stain, and you're able to compare the number of products and the size of those products in order to get an idea of if it probably worked. And if you want to really, really know for sure whether it worked, well, now you're going to actually have to go ahead purify that out that out that plasmid and send it for sequencing. Because with all these methods, even with the methods that give us the most information, so even with that um, our like best method, the orientation specific primers, even in this case, we're not being able to tell what is happening over here or what is happening over here. So the only reason that we actually know is is okay is the region where the primer binds directly. Um, and so we know that that sequence is present, but we don't know that everything around it is okay, that there aren't any typos. And sometimes if the primer is not like perfectly specific, it might be a little minor typo where the primer binds actually as well. And so in order to actually test if there's any typos in here, we need to do some sequencing. I can tell based on the size of the products whether the insert is about the right size. Um, but we don't know if the sequence is okay. And so this is why we can do sequencing. And so now you would actually go ahead, you would do that mini prep with that little bit that you set aside and you can send it for sequencing. And now there are different types of sequencing. So traditionally what's been done is that you use primers. Um, in this case, you actually just use one primer and it's because it's just making like one copy and then as it makes the copy, it's getting sequenced. So you have these like di terminator nucleotides where basically the different DNA letters have different fluorescent um, fluorophores on them. And then as the PCR happens, you're getting the readout of which bases were added based on which fluorescent um, molecule is seen. These days, techniques um, for sequencing have gotten um, a lot cheaper to do things that we actually just send this entire vector for sequence, entire plasmid for sequencing, um, rather than actually having to tell them which primers to use. What's nice is some, a lot of times because people use the same sort of plasmids, there'll be conventional like primer binding sites. Um, so it's like multiple cloning sites or something like MCS is, um, you'll see that these the primer that these plasmids are designed so that they have like a bunch of restriction cut sites and common PCR binding sites on the outside of where the insert goes in so that people can use standard, um, standard sequencing primers. And so you have to order sequencing primers each time and the company can often put them in for you. But these days it's kind of new in a lot of cases if you're using something like a whole plasmid sequencing where you just send them your plasmid and it'll give you the sequence of the entire thing. Um, when you get that sequence, you want to make sure that you're checking to make sure there aren't any typos. The common place, the most common places you'll see typos are where you actually do that stitching together to where the insert meets the parent vector. As I mentioned, another common method is inward local restriction digest. I talked about this yesterday. It's a similar in concept to the colony PCR in that you're looking to see if specific um, piece sequences are present, but in this case, instead of using it, doing it using PCR and based on the specificity of primers, you're doing it based on restriction enzymes and on the specificity of them recognizing specific DNA sequences and cutting them. And similarly to how we can call in PCR, sometimes like if we use an orientation specific primer, we have a primer that binds directly in the insert. Um, sometimes we have cut sites that are in the insert. Other times we have cut sites that are just in the plasmid. Similarly to how sometimes we just have PCR primers that are just in the plasmid. And in those cases, then we have to rely on there being different size pieces, different size products. With the analytical restriction digest, 
here you're not making copies of anything so you have to purify out that plasmid and use the purified thing in order to have enough DNA and that sort of thing to be able to see it on the gel and so that what else, whatever else is in the cell isn't interfering with things. With colony PCR, here you only need a really tiny amount because you're going to make copies of it. And so this is why we can kind of just touch that colony and stick it into our PCR mix. When we stick it into that PCR mix, what's going to happen is that the PCR mix, we're often using some sort of master mix that has magnesium, it has DNA polymerase, has the DNA um, nucleotides, and this is everything we need. And so we also add the primers, and now we need the template. And so typically we're using some sort of purified template when we do PCR. But with colony PCR, we're just taking that little bit of colony. What happens is that during that melt stage, when you have this initial like high heating up to separate the strands, that's also going to lice or break open the cells, which is going to allow those DNA pieces to be freed and therefore, the, those pieces can be used as templates for making the, making the DNA copies, but the copies are only going to get made if the sequence is present for the primers to bind. And the, prime, the size of the pieces is going to depend on whether the insert, or in some cases, the size of the piece is going to depend on whether or not the insert is actually present. And by designing primers in different ways, we can get different information get an idea of whether or not our insert is actually in that plasmid, and then we can send it for sequencing to be sure. There are also methods that we can use that are screening methods that can kind of help us prioritize which of these colonies we want to check. There might be a ton of colonies on the plate, and so we're like, okay, well, how do we know which ones are likely to have, likely to have our insert? One way that we can do this is with blue-white screening. In this case, we have a plasmid where it has this gene for make, allowing the bacteria to make a blue product. If we, then we have our insertion site inside of that gene. If our insert, if our gene gets in there, what's gonna happen is it's gonna disrupt that blue making gene. And so then you're not gonna be able to make the blue product. When you grow this on a special plate that has that, um, that has the chemicals that the bacteria can turn blue, if you've disrupted their blue making gene, well now they can't make it blue. If you haven't, those will they know will make this blue product. And so the colonies that have something inserted are going to be white, and the ones that don't are going to be blue. And then you can use your colony PCR in order to basically test well, well, is there an insert in there that is the right size? Is there an insert in there if you're using an insert specific primer that actually has the sequence of interest in that one part at least? And then if all that looks okay, then you can go ahead and send it for sequencing. So I hope that helps you understand colony PCR and some other methods that you can use in order to check your cloning.